Great, so this session is going to be a panel discussion on FIP 36. Uh, the title is Proposing a Crypto Economic Change, Getting 551 Comments and Putting It to Vote. Uh, so just, uh, just some context for everyone, software changes to the file phone protocol must be proposed as an open source governance process known as a FIP, or a file phone improvement, improvement proposal. They are then deliberated by the community, and if general agreement is clear with respect to the proposal's value, technical feasibility, and the resolution of any raised issues or objections, the proposal is implemented in the next version of the, net, uh, the next network upgrade. This is known as soft consensus. Fed 36 is a proposal from the Crypto Econ Lab that would fine tune some core crypto economic parameters in an attempt to incentivize longer term behaviors in alignment with the network. If accepted, this would mean changes to many business assumptions for network participants and storage providers, and has therefore generated a lot of different perspectives that have not led to the normally uh, the normal soft consensus route. 551 GitHub comments later, and with an ongoing vote for Phil's stakeholders, this panel discusses this panel discussion seeks to explore motivation, analysis, analysis governance process, and most salient questions surrounding the our panelists are Juan Bene, founder and inventor of PFS and Filecoin, uh, ZX Deng, the lead of Crypto Econ Lab, Tom Mellon, lead researcher at Crypto Econ Lab, and Caitlin Beagle, the governance TDM at the Filecoin Foundation. Uh, and my name is Bene. <laughs> my name is Bene. A lot of other people have worked on inventing the loss of Filecoin, so I'm um, just kidding. Yeah. This is one of the guys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, just to start, uh, let's, let's start with Juan. Um, for some context, we'll, we'll get into the technical details uh, in a moment, but can you please first summarize uh, at a high level what FIP36 is hoping to accomplish? Um, there's a lot of uh, pieces of this FIP. Um, I think this FIP will be very different in different points in time. Um, I think this same, I will submit the same FIP now and six months from now, a year from now, a year from now. Um, I feel pretty uh, good about that in the long term. Uh, however, what it does in different points in time, um, is more of what is happening macroeconomically. Um, at the core of the FIP is one component to uh, increase the, uh, the duration of the fire um, uh, for games. So this means we want to extend the duration of games. Uh, this comes from the, the goal of extending duration for deals comes from the long-term goal of the platform of supporting deals for users that want to store the, uh, their data for long periods of time. So that's uh, the core of where that's coming from. Uh, the second piece is to incentivize the long-term duration of deals uh, to encourage for many more participants to do that, to so that introduces a multiplier um, alongside the Falcon Plus to incentivize the longer distribution of deals. Uh, the third component is around um, increasing an uh, economic parameter, which is the, the target lock in um, in the uh, in one of the, the components that calculates how much Collateral is involved with um, adding sectors into the network. Um, and that's going to be from 30 to 50. Um, uh, that's an economic parameter that we put into the network uh, many years ago. Um, similar to other economic parameters like that in other networks, since the launch of Filecoin and the evolution of many other networks, um, we've seen that uh, those parameters should actually be much higher than the previous years. Um, we just didn't know how um, how that parameter would play out in the long run, um, and so we decided it would be thought was like a pretty reasonable uh, conservative target of thirty percent. Since then, the whole world has found a lot more data. Um, now we think um, it should be higher. Um, I'm an outlier case here. I don't know if it's like always my opinion. I think it should be much higher. It should be something like six or seven percent. Um, but that's you know whole story for another day. Um, probably years from now. Um, the um, but that you know many other conditions in there. Now, the uh, larger um, macro discussion of this bit in this moment in time, like why now versus say a year, a year later, is that the, um, the token demand that would result as the collateral is increased um, are an economic change in this moment in a broader macroeconomic context where there's a, a large set of economic changes happening in the world um, and Falcon's economy is embedded within the broader macroeconomic. Um, and so it, there's a goal set there around um, adjusting the economic parameters of Bitcoin as a response to what's happening, happening in, in the broader world. 
Um, so why now? It's, it's now because um, it seems to be important and valuable um, to adjust these parameters in this moment as opposed to, say, a year from now. Uh, but I have a personal experience in that um, in the future, uh, one year or two years from now. Uh, I don't know if that's what you're looking for, but uh, there is something about the rest of it. I'm not the main author on this book, uh, so other folks have worked on it dramatically more than I have. I kind of um, helped describe it at the very beginning, and then um, have mostly been um, uh, like working on the things. Um, but yeah, that, that's pretty helpful. No, that, that's, that's pretty helpful. So, you know, five minutes a day just for a job work. Uh, longer term commitments is a good thing when it comes to data. Um, and there's also this broader macroeconomic backdrop that underlies a lot of um, what we want the, the proposal of this fit and also like how that has that discussion has evolved over time. I think that's a really interesting point that you bring up. So maybe uh, ZX or someone else, if you want to talk about that, like my now component a little bit more, um, talk a little bit more about this you know, macroeconomic backdrop. I think that might be really helpful to set the stage uh, as we get more deeper into the technical details. Yes, yes. Yeah, sure. Um, so I think there are a few factors on a macro level, and I think that's um, let's put the network macro as a whole, where like we know all sectors on Filecoin has an expiration. Where like um, right now we based on analysis we see like massive wave of secondary potential sector uh, expiration coming to the network. So, well, maybe uh, maybe not all of them would expire. Some of them might get extended and whatnot, but there's a potential of this kind of. Um, it's a constant thing that was always fighting, where right? it really depends on like the the average duration of the sector on the network, right? And as we keep on growing and scaling the network, if you always have sector expiring at a very uh, high frequency, it becomes a constant drag to network stability. Right? Like we want to build uh, web scale um, blockchain systems where, right? like, uh, with this kind of like constant churn, it's a really waste of resources, and it's really like dragging the network uh, down from achieving its goal. So, and then with the expiration, that also comes with the initial pledge that was previously locked up, right? So, um, and that was hit by many different things, right? Like, I think just a year ago, there was a broader um, exit from China, from all the Chinese, uh, for all, many of our service providers. And then there's also the crypto winter and global mac, um, uh, market is going down. And then at the same time, you have war, a war from, um, around the world, some parts of the world. And then uh, people are raising interest rates, and then uh, COVID is still around in some parts of the world. So there are many, many like um, macroeconomic headwinds that are just like hitting the global economy and also the Falcon economy. So um, when you combine these two, so like uh, you have like much more, uh, much more sluggish uh, sort of, uh, sector onboarding, right? Because China is out, the rest of the world are trying to grow, but like you don't, uh, at the same time, you don't have that much interest in capital going to invest in Filecoin SP, so I really like put money behind Filecoin SP and help them grow their business. So you see this, uh, this like sluggish um, onboarding growth. At the same time, uh, there, there's a constant wave of sector exploration releasing lots of tokens to the network. Um, and this creates this like, very unfavorable economic condition on the Filecoin network level. And that's why, like, and then we, based on the analysis, we expect, expect a pretty big wave from now to maybe like Q1 and Q2 next year. Okay, and just one more thought in there. Um, if you go back to look at the uh, distribution of, uh, and it would be great to like, have a graph here, uh, maybe in the video we can have that graph. Um, if you look at the distribution of circulating supply um, uh, week, like daily, uh, say in the height of the sector onboarding, uh, right around the week, we're working on hyperdrive and so on, you had all the indications that the network was going to scale super fast and people wanted to have more and more and more data. Um, and then the uh, shift in, in uh, policy came in China, which sort of on the wound that. Um, but in that period, you can see the amount of sector onboarding offsetting of all other issues, uh, putting Falcon uh, in the same category as Ethereum, um, with it, with EIP uh, and so on, where the issuance and the and the spend um, and the lock-in is balancing out. So uh, that's, a, that's a favorable economic uh, condition for, for the whole network. Um, and the network should wants to kind of be at that state, uh, and you can get it multiple ways. You can uh, get back to onboarding 50 or 60 petabytes per day. That's pretty hard. Uh, you can also get to onboarding five or six uh, petabytes of useful data storage. We're actually quite close to that. Like, you know, um, when we started this day, we were at about 0.3 or 0.4 uh, tips a day. We're now um, getting close to one, two. We're, we're over two tip, uh, tips a day now, but we're not sure whether that's going to be the same, you know, a few months from now. 
Um, and the third thing you can do is you can, you can adjust the economic parameters to, to shift multipliers. Um, and so a shift in the multipliers that become a year from now, two years from now, uh, might be advantageous now to the next. And that's kind of what this fit. Um, uh, sorry. sorry to interrupt you. Um, um, yeah. Great. Yeah, so you know, to summarize, there are some global macroeconomic headwinds, some headwinds specific to crypto, and within that, some headwinds specific to what is happening within the Falcon economy that's creating this uh, kind of backdrop that, that might you know, be pretty important when we understand the fifth. Um, so uh, now that we have some shared context, um, Tom, I think you'd be a great person to kind of talk about some of the specific details that FIP is uh, proposing to change uh, in its final form as it exists now um, as FIP 36 in the FIP repo in, uh, on, you know, in the Falcon. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, thanks, Vic. I'm happy to talk about So, I mean, talking about the macro and the, and the wider motivation for mine, uh, they sort of touched on uh, a few of the key parameters, but I can give you a little bit more specifics uh, if that's helpful. I mean, so it's kind of key three things that are changing. Um, the first one is sector durations. So, currently, it's a minimum six months, maximum uh, a year and a half. And, and this is going to change. Uh, minimum sector duration up to uh, one year, and maximum up to three and a half years. Um, so at the minute, there's kind of quite a distribution of um, sector distributions between six months um, and a year. That's quite spread out, maybe average a bit over a year. So we're going to try to shift that up. And what that will do, it kind of helps the dynamics in the sense that it just slows down, stretches out the inflow and outflow, and helps stabilize the, uh, the amount of the supply that's locked. And this is kind of an important thing. Uh, so, so that's one thing. Um, another thing that we're going to, to look at, uh, that we propose in the film, is to change the target. So Juan's already explained uh, a little bit what the target is. Uh, so uh, I mean, the, the target has a few purposes really. It helps with security. Security from the perspective of the whole value of the network. Security from the perspective of slashing. Um, but also there's kind of an economic role there. Uh, it, it, the target lock, it doesn't guarantee how much is locked, but it does target uh, a specific value. Um, so it won't guarantee that 50% of the value will be locked, but it will point things in that direction. So that's what we proposed. And whenever I say proposed, I mean, what we've done is sort of similar to what Danilo and Block Science and ZX did a couple of years back. I mean, going through the simulations, of the supply, looking at tons of different scenarios, trying to build up a picture and trying to understand what could possibly happen. Um, and through that, um, trying to select a path that we think uh, can work reasonably well for you. Uh, so that's the target, it's the same thing. And then the, um, the final thing, uh, the, the kind of funky thing that we've suggested changing in this fit uh, is to introduce a second tradition multiplier. And this is kind of to recognize um, that if storage providers are going to store for much longer durations, this is taking a, you know, it's a much bigger commitment uh, on their behalf. It, it's more risk. This can be or should be rewarded more. Um, and it acts as an incentive as well to do something that we think is good for the network. So for the sector duration supplier, we set a scope of one. Um, this is something that we looked into, and a lot of the researchers argued about it a lot. How should the sector duration look like? Should it be convex, concave, you know, sloping up? Um, uh, what, what should the slope be? And this is something that we tried to figure out. Um, I got a lot of feedback from the storage providers as well, because initially we were thinking the slope should be much higher, uh, but the, the storage providers were, were pretty light, which you know, we, we really don't need such a big incentive to encourage people to store for longer. So we've taken that into account um, and ended up with the sector duration multiplier so on. Um, so I think those are the key three things that we change that we're going to use it more time. Yeah, I think that's a great overview. I think anyone else has anything to add, but um, I think uh, that, that alludes to another interesting uh, part of this, which is it's been, there's been a huge dialogue. Excuse me, there's been a huge dialogue behind this, right? So you said like the slope has changed. Uh, there has been sort of some kind of feedback from various different stakeholder groups. Um, I think maybe Caitlin, as someone who's kind of over, you know, not not an author uh, or explicit proponent of the FIP, but someone who's seen the governance process. Um, could you talk a little bit about this, the community response that Tom kind of alluded to? Uh, what are some of the main questions and maybe concerns that they're, they're raising, and how have you seen that kind of dialogue between, let's say, the authors and uh, other members of the community progress?
progress over the, let's say, the past two months uh, between the initial iteration and where we are now? Yeah, yeah, that's a, a huge question um, and a really important one. Um, so within my role, um, the thing that I do every single day is figure out how we take an open and decentralized community and we make decisions. Okay, so it's about who gets what, when, and how. And how do we do this and answer these questions in a way that is both robust for the network, but also legitimate within our community? And Filecoin is a very new protocol. It's maturing rapidly. But for most, excuse me, most of the time, the FIPS that we get are relatively two-dimensional. They can be really complex and really impressive pieces of technology. But oftentimes what they propose are these fundamental technical enhancements that are value-added to everyone. It doesn't matter if you're a token holder, a storage provider, a data client, an engineer. These are things that we want. They provide direct and immediate value. And so the question we have is how can we prepare for this in the most effective way possible? FIP 36, I like to say, is a three-dimensional FIP. Um, and it's one that we always knew we would eventually get to. ZX and I actually met with some of our friends from Block Science, which is a Helicon Network partner, in January of this year to talk about just this problem of how do we design more robust systems to answer something that is fundamentally not just technical, but existential in nature. And at that point, we realized is we don't know, but we don't think it's coming yet. And the reason is, is that Filecoin is still really, really young. With FIP36, however, when this was released by the community, or to the community in June of this year, I remember having a conversation with Vic at the very beginning of July where he said, I actually think this is going to be great because we designed this to help storage providers and it's going to be a really quick thing for us to put to the community, talk about it for a few weeks, and then it's going to be the right time for the next network upgrade, which is really fast. And what we've got were not only almost 600 individual proposals and comments and analyses, we got two separate uh, open source and independently produced our lot of calculators for storage providers. We had countless AMAs, panels, midnight meetings, emergency sessions, community calls, all of these different things that generated constant feedback and led to more than six different iterations of this fifth draft. It has been an intense process that has broken our entire standard operating procedure for FIPS. Um, but from my perspective, I will not lie, it's been chaos, but it's been really good chaos because it gives us the momentum and the opportunity to actually probe this process to know that we're getting to the place where community members are beginning to understand the value out of participating in community governance. And it gives us an excellent jumping off point for actually designing and iterating the next step for FIT processes. So that we not only never have this kind of, you know, complex and burdensome process in the future, but that we know that when we go through these processes, the network is able to absorb these proposed changes in ways that are efficient and productive but that community members, too, are able to equally participate in this process and give us the feedback that has really, honestly, driven so much of this, uh, of this process. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, if, uh, faithful, uh, yeah more faithful, less true words may not have been spoken by me in July, uh, which I'd be back then, but, you know, it's part of the process. Uh, you have some, like, I know that you're, you have so much advice for everybody on how we can improve all this, and all of us can learn from this process together on like, what went well, what and so on, we all deserve a really good retro at the end of like, figuring out how to improve all the processes. Um, do you have any advice for us now uh, as a community, having like, stewarded our entire um, uh, process, like things that like, you think, from your perspective, are like, really key to, I don't know, uh, reserve your Sorry, it's like, no, it's too I, I really appreciate that question. I think it's a really good one. Um, I think there are, you know, operation challenges, you know? For a long time, again, FIPS were a pretty straightforward and very technical process. We need people, we need resources, we need tooling, we need the kinds of things that we've always really like thought and dreamed about, but which there hadn't been very much demand for. The demand is here. We knew it was always going to come, and again, now we have that opportunity to really seize it. Um, but I think the other thing to remember is that the Filecoin community, very broadly, is very unique, um, especially compared to other types of Web3 communities. Filecoin is a fantastic vision for the future, for the web, for our economies, for the ways that we work in this space. But it is also very complicated. It is a deep tech stack. I have worked here for a year and a half. I wrote my master's thesis on Filecoin. I still am learning new things every single day, right? And the people who invest and participate in this community are incredibly knowledgeable. So when we say we got 551 GitHub comments,
comments. That wasn't a bunch of yay or nay comments. Those are multi-paragraph analyses and responses from people who are very heavily involved in this network. They have been for years. Many of them have been here since mainnet launch, almost two years ago, and they are deeply knowledgeable about what they think the future of the network should be. I think it is really important for us to remember that when we are thinking of proposals, we're thinking of the way that they're going to introduce change to the network. We begin to think of them less like these kind of essays we're writing, these theses we're proposing, and as actual products that we are stewarding, that there is change management considerations to be made. And for us to remember that there is untapped knowledge and expertise that we can mine from our community in much more productive ways. Um, everyone has the exact same goal, <laughs> truly. Um, and it's important for us to remember that. I think the, the conversation that we had was really, really productive for the most part. Um, but I think that there's a way for us to derive residual value for everyone from it. Um, so I think uh, one more thing just in the specifics that maybe can illustrate this, this the way that we try to navigate this process uh, over time is could we just briefly talk about some of some of those changes like what was the result of that discussion? What was the result of some of that community dialogue? You know, five hundred and fifty one comments had to result in something, right? So uh, Tom, perhaps maybe uh, or or ZX if you want to talk a little bit about how that fit this fit has changed from let's say June to, to now, uh, that would be great. Um, and maybe I don't want to ask you to summarize that for comments, but let's give us a deal they are. That'd be great. Uh, I mean, I, I can start off and then maybe ZX can take over. Um, I mean, if I just think back, the first thing that springs to mind is initially, well, I kind of mentioned this already, but initially we had the slope on multiplier being 2, um, and we had the, the target multiplier being 0 0.4, and it quickly became apparent, I mean, within a, a week or two, we were getting pretty strong feedback from the slope to us, and now this is much too strong. Uh, so we kind of went back to our simulations and we tried to see, okay, so how can we still provide a strong incentive uh, to save from our emissions while also achieving the economic goals, the wider economic goals of the fit as well. And we, we found that, okay, so if, if, we can, if we can drop down the slope of the, the sector duration multiplier, but increase the, the, the target duration multiplier, uh, uh, target local multiplier, excuse me, then this pretty much gets us to the same place. So that was, I think, the first iteration that we did. Um, and then we had a, I mean, the, the next iteration, or perhaps the last iteration, um, is that we ended up uh, reducing the, uh, the length um, of the maximum durations. Just uh, instead of going for five years, as initially intended, to 3.5 years, just to solve things and make it less of a big job. Perhaps in the future, uh, you know, another fit would come along and we'd increase it to five years in a year's time. Uh, but um, based on the feedback that we were getting from storage providers, they wanted to see something more gradual. And I totally agree with that. I mean, if it was up to me, I would love to see something that's really slow. Uh, you know, you change it a little bit and then you see what happens. But there's a little bit of tension there as well in the sense that. It's difficult to economic fits frequently, and also the story providers need a kind of sense of something being fixed, so, so you can have some planning in terms of your business as well, so changing frequently is kind of tricky. But do you want to say anything else? Yes. Um, yeah, so I think, so I think for this bit, um, there's just like waves and waves of engagement. I think one of the biggest thing we have a very strong engagement around the community and many groups that provided very different feedback. And then like, I think through this FIP, we also, there's like another two or three other FIP that were created because of this FIP. Um, and then like, um, I think also because of this, this FIP, our entire community has come together a lot more strongly, I would say, even though we may not fully agree, but like, I think that everybody like, oh, it's a strong engagement. And then like, I think from an author's point of view, we see ways and ways of feedback. Yes. Have like one group, oh, this, and then, okay, right, let's do the analysis, let's go fix it, all right, this, and all right, let's do something, and let's try to do analysis too, and this. Oh, by the way, this and this and this too. Um, but overall, I think that resulted in like, um, again, like all fans said earlier, nobody knows um, the future, but all we, can, all we can do is trying to uh, discuss this community and try to prepare for, for our network, right? I think this is the, uh, one of the biggest takeaway here. And of course, as a community, we can also learn how to engage in this kind of discussion in a more um, thoughtful and more fruitful way. I think that's all learning there. We can get that later. But I think, like, um, I think it's a great and, and being here in Singapore, right? Like, I think we 
it's so great to be able to chat with so many of us in our community in person. And I think like there's lots of like good exchange of ideas, people understand different perspectives. And honestly, from an author's point of view, where like we we think this is good for the network, but we are somewhat neutral, but we are leaning towards it. But what we really want is that people understand what we are deciding on. If you understand the trade or done the analysis, that will make sure people acknowledge, oh yeah, there's this kind of possibility. And then we can make our own you can make our own decision as a, and then coming together we make a decision as a network. And that's kind of where we are now with the evolution. Yeah. And uh, so uh, the takeaway is is the deal the art is uh, there's been a lot that's happened on this bit. When it comes with the engagement with the community. Um, is there a sliding projector right now? Because there should be one. Um, thank you. So, uh, part of that engagement is resulted in something uh, in the utilization of the photo bulb, um, which I think we will be on to and hopefully to talk a little bit about that. Talk a little bit about. But um, the engagement has been phenomenal. There have been almost 2,000 votes cast in the photo bulb on this bit, uh, and, it, and, and, and there is a Interesting buckets of categories that we've created uh, that we have uh, when it comes to like, you know, showing results. Uh, just a quick thing is this poll is still open. Uh, the poll closes September 28th tomorrow at 10 p.m. UTC. Well, I guess for us that would be September 29th, very early in the morning. Uh, run to the polls. Run to the polls, yeah. But uh, Caitlin, I think, uh, can you talk a little bit about like the governance? How, well, you know, we've talked about governance in general more philosophically. Uh, can we talk about a little bit more about this? in particular and, and why we ended up at this poll um, to, to help determine uh, whether it may, maybe this potential inclusion. Yeah, so uh, okay. this is a really tough process and I think this is one that the community didn't get to see um, as much as they did sort of the external comments about the content of the FIP. Um, as Vic mentioned when he did his opening, we oftentimes use this process of soft consensus, which again, works really well for those kind of two-dimensional technical proposals that everyone wants to see. Okay? It makes it easy for us to plan, make sure everything is openly documented, gather community feedback, iterate, and then implement. Um, with this though, when you have 551 comments and countless secondary and tertiary spin-outs, um, you do not have an ability to gauge yes or no. Right? Um, again, a lot of this feedback is complex. It makes other proposals and changes, and we really had to decide what we were going to do in order to make a decision and move forward. Because remember, as Juan just said, there was a time component to this. We have a network upgrade coming. We think that this is something that, given uh, macroeconomic conditions more globally, we need to do now. And so there were a lot of constraints that led us down to decide that polling the community directly was going to be the best course of action. Um, this was something that we were very divided on. Um, and that's because, you know, uh, DAOs sometimes vote, protocols usually don't. But we felt that um, compared to other options, including deferring to core devs to make a decision, right? Um, this is a process that had been really community driven. The six different iterations of the FIP that came out, um, that took a lot of compromise internally from within your team. I saw that very frequently. Um, but it's because being really honest and being able to respond to those community requests and genuine interest um, was a really driving motivator for everyone who was working on this day and night. Um, so we decided the fill poll was going to be the most legitimate and accessible way for us to continue to allow the community members to um, air their sentiments and effectively say, yes or no, I accept or reject this fit. And again, you have one more day to do that, and you have not. In particular, look at all that, right? Uh, first of all, it's great to see the level of engagement that we got. Um, can we get the slide back? So it. um, it's, it's amazing to see the turnout we got. It's really great to see that many participants engaged very directly in the governance of Cloudline. This is your network. We're doing this together. We're building this um, foundation for humanities uh, information together. It's very important that you engage in the process by submitting FIPs, by discussing them, by implementing them, by working on them, and sometimes when needed by voting in terms of here. Uh, but you know, it's kind of like, uh, so, so it's great to get a bunch of engagement. It also, um, what was really useful in the grade here uh, to me is that even though at many moments it felt super heated that everyone thought X, um, the grade shows that most people don't care, or can't vote, or didn't, didn't make it in time. So there's one of many possible explanations. Maybe they really care, 
and couldn't vote for a variety of reasons. Maybe they're um, a participant who's uh, uh, maybe they're a token holder and their custodian doesn't enable voting. That sucks. You can't cast your vote. Uh, Armor, hey, that's a good suggestion for improvement for our community to say, hey, custodians have the facilities for voting, and sometimes that may be relevant. Um, or maybe um, uh, you have an organization where people are very divided, and if you don't know where to vote, maybe you do really care where you can and vote. Or what's more likely, you haven't engaged, you don't care, or you haven't even heard. There's probably a set of folks who haven't even heard about all of this in full, maybe they've heard a little bit, but don't understand anything. So the, the, the kind of like sentiment here um, is very useful to get us feedback for us that voice with all kinds of improvements. Uh, and one of them I think is like getting even broader, broader engagement from, from all members. Um, that's right, I completely agree. Um, and I'd like to point out selfishly a bit more um, that this is a poll that we have to stand up very, very quickly in order to service all of the competing demands that were in place during the SIP process. Um, it's not a perfect school, a poll never is. They're deceptively complicated. Um, but again, in the spirit of this being a really community-driven process, um, we have a space for it now, it's not very well used, but beginning next week we're going to be kicking off a huge pressure process for this fifth that includes um, anonymous and non-anonymous uh, community feedback. Um, but additionally, we're going to be revamping the way that we engage community members with uh, governance design as well. Um, and hopefully modeling file and classic methods of, of open governance as well to make it easier for community members to weigh in on these processes as they're unfolding. So if that's something that's of interest to you, um, do you find me after this because I'd love to talk with you more about it. Yeah, uh, it sounds to me that you know, engagement comes in many forms. One of them may be voting, but maybe more importantly is actual engagement in GitHub discussion comments with presenting FIPS, debating FIPS, uh, talking about governance, all of these things. Uh, are likely more impactful than just you know, signing a message on Glyph or via a Lotus command line interface, right? Um, we're, we're a community, um, and that's a definitely way to engage. So speaking of, I think this is a great opportunity to field some questions from, from you guys, from the audience. Um, on the, the yeah, sorry. Uh, maybe as people are getting ready and thinking about your questions, uh, we just voice some thoughts about, um, about changes in the platform network. Uh, I got a really good question about this. Um, at uh, yesterday in, in, in uh, um, AMA. Um, the question was about like, when should changes be happening to, to the network? With what frequency? Is, uh, should Fox kind of like, set parameters and be, be frozen, like Bitcoin? Uh, or should there be kind of more ongoing changes like, like Ethereum or what sort of cadence? Um, and the, the, the thought here is like, think, of, um, think of the level of changes that need to come from a network like this as being a function of the goal of the network. The sort of the, what is the goal of the network? What kind of service does it need to provide? And what are the dynamics around that service that might cause the service to change? So for example, for a transactional processing system where all its goal is to send money from one place to another, like Bitcoin, the changes could, can be very few. The changes can sort of get frozen in time and have very few changes. Arguably, you could probably be getting your proof of work the way that it's but I'm you know, pretty good one. Um, but the point is, some networks can have a lot less change. Uh, Ethereum has way more change than Bitcoin. It's been evolving and changing a lot of parameters and so on. They even went to the extremely difficult decision of like migrating um, out into uh, proof of state because that made the network better. And that destroyed the entire proof of work business, right? Like that, uh, what, what proof of work um, miner in Ethereum was going to vote for, for, for that, right? It was a super contentious thing that took Ethereum for four ish years to like work through. That's like super, super hard. Um, however, they did it because it was critical for the whole network to move in, that, in one direction. Now, the Vodcoin has to provide a very useful uh, cloud storage service to the world. It has to be a robust platform for storing data, for making that data usable and useful and valuable to the applications and users and all. The mission is to provide a decentralized, robust, and efficient foundation for humanity's there's a lot there. And in order to do that, not only do we have to provide a bunch of services uh, and systems in place, we have to dynamically adjust to how those demands will change. Imagine that you built a web in 1990 and you froze it and you said, no more changes. The web of 1990 is going to stick around. Uh, if you want to go to a URL, you have to click file, go to a URL, I'll open the box, press the uh, and type whatever you want. You can't paste and good luck. That's it. That's what you get. Never going to change. 
right? Like, that doesn't work. Obviously, it doesn't work. Um, these systems have to adapt and evolve. Now, what's in, an important um, thing that basic engineering have to figure out is what should change at what cadence and how to do it. There are important shifts and changes that will have to happen um, quickly. It could be those two-dimensional changes that can happen very quickly, and everyone wants them, and that's good. There will also be hard changes that not everyone will want that also need to happen quickly, that we need to build the kind of like decision-making muscles together to be able to do much more efficiently and much better for everyone in the long term. And that, and as part of that broader record that we need to do, we need to figure out how can we save a lot of time and effort to be able to make these adjustments faster as a whole community. Um, and then we also have to be clear that some things, we figure out the set of things that shouldn't be changing or should be changing less, or where we have to have better foresight because we just won't be able to change faster. Because it matters for everybody that they, they uh, become uh, reliable over many years. Right? Part of why the block of work is so important and so valuable for every, everything and everyone um, is that the, uh, uh, the, the block of work um, can be counted on to, to stick around for a long time. But this is an opportunity to ask questions. However, so uh, if anyone has anything to like, or, or questions or concerns, you know, uh, that would be this, this is the time to have some of the knowledge here. Hi, um, sorry, we just had a few minutes of response, so sorry it's my question, it's already answered somehow. I was wondering, uh, it's fine for me a lot of research experiments have how to construct a market. So many of those are actually also applicable for other applications as well. So is there any way that we can kind of repurpose that knowledge of how to construct a market in crypto context into other projects? Uh, for example, modularizing that or even turn that into theory, etc. Yeah, so I think um, the market always exists. I think the question is like what is the volume of the market? And then I think what crypto brings to the table is you get a set of like um, verifiable, um, auto auto executing kind of like um, execution environment that as long as certain conditions are met, um, the the contract executed right. And then you can reduce a lot of the coordination costs right, like maybe like the discovery costs, and then like maybe like the uh, dispute resolution costs uh, through a lot of these like crypto primitives. So I think uh, of course it's always case by case right, but I think like. The good thing, um, I think one general rule uh, for starting a market really is to find an initial traction. Right? It doesn't really matter. It could just be like pen and paper even. But uh, hey, you have an order. All right, cool. You want some? All right, here you go. Right? As, well, as we start building up that traction, then we can find more, more and more ways to leverage the crypto primitive to really like automate and then like, scale up the business. Happens and I cannot take advantage of it immediately. 
immediately, everybody else will, and I will be left behind. So that's kind of like the, the, the biggest worry. Um, one part of that is figuring out, hey, actually, other people taking advantage of it is a probability distribution that has many factors. How, much, how many resources do they have available and so on? So there's, there's a complex distribution there that you have to take into account. Not everyone's going to take advantage of it right away. Not everyone's going to take advantage of it at the same levels, and so on. Um, it is very true that this is harder for um, DLSPs to, uh, to deal with. It just introduces more work, and therefore, um, it is less advantageous to, like, it is much more advantageous to CC uh, providers than to uh, DLSPs. Um, stepping back from, on, a, on a larger picture, um, there's this kind of misconception about uh, CC that it doesn't provide any value to the network. Uh, I've heard it many times uh, from many deal providers. We want to store everyone's data and, and make it useful for everybody. Ideally, the whole network would have mass um, uh, uh storage and everything would be kind of, uh, full of data. Uh, however, CC, CC uh, uh, sectors contribute massive amounts of value to the network itself. Think of um, proof of work in Bitcoin or proof of work in Ethereum and now proof of safety in Ethereum. That work is the same, like the, that, that utility that the, that process brings to those networks is the same utility that CC sectors provide to Bitcoin. Now, of course, we want deal data to be, um, because it's much more valuable. How much more valuable is it to us? Seems to be 10x, we agree on 10x. Uh, as a whole community, that's what the value is. It, it could arguably could be smaller, it arguably could be larger. Um, that parameter is like um, set at one time, but it theoretically you know, can be, it's really a function of many other things. But that's kind of what we, what we are working on. Now to your question about, hey, how do we make sure that this fit now um, is, how, how should deal providers, um, like providers that are storing deals and helping with the onboarding, deal with this in this moment. One part is, like, let's figure out what in the business can we help storage providers that are taking deals now. Uh, with the, how do we make the impact of this, this hit, like any, whatever negative impacts there are, um, smoother and easier on those folks. That could be like, figure, uh, like for example, the loan programs and loan providers tend to lend out to much larger groups than smaller groups. Like that's one of the big issues. We have to solve that. A number of us have been working on that to try and get loan providers to offer to smaller groups. Um, we haven't been successful yet in producing uh, a program that's really accessible by everybody. Um, maybe once at the end arrives, maybe we'll, we'll, that, that will, will be easier to provide. Um, but we're not there yet. Um, this will be a great opportunity for folks to get involved in this and take what is a very good business um, and support the, the, uh, the store providers. So a number of us are working on that. That's one piece. Um, another component of this is working to improve um, uh, the fit by uh, we're working to improve the network to enable um, the decoupling of deals and sectors. So that you, you are able to make very long-term deals and the sector duration is different. So for example, today those are coupled. They don't have to be coupled in long-term. You should be able in the future to make a deal for say 10 or 15 years and place that 10, 15 year deal into a sector that is six months or one year, one year or whatever. Um, that should be two steps. However, it's very difficult to get to that right now. We could talk about that, um, that kind of possibility uh, uh, later on. But that's one of the kind of improvements that, that, that uh, can and should have. Um, the broader picture and uh, the wide now. The macro question, like, like we were saying earlier, um, a, lot of, a lot of folks thought, like, hey, this is going to be great. SPs are going are, are to um, be really for it. And, um, hey, actually, it's not going to be software. Um, and the, the point there is um, our thinking on this and the timing is that this is more valuable for everybody now. Um, and I think we need to find a way, a really good way to, if it's not passing, because it may not, right? we'll, we'll see what ends up occurring. We need to figure out a way to help all the um, DL source providers to um, uh, work with this and that might be by um, either the loan programs or through um, other, other software changes and so on. Does that help? Uh, is there anything else like more concrete that you yeah, the last one you said today, you said that it's, it's very, very sure. Um, and I agree with what you've got to say about community engagement. We know, my goodness, it's very sure. Um, two things that story the story provider just you know, recently is the PSC for the latest day. Uh, I've never seen so much engagement. And I think it's great because not only that people talking with the media and the story providers that have been around a while, but we've never actually heard from. They're also looking into 
really exciting things that are coming out, like Seth's in the station, and that kind of So that's an, another really good thing. Um, I mean, for the Lenians and problems that he said that, he's really good. Um, and it's also great to hear there's going to be a retro, um, something like that. I'll message you directly. Um, your note on the engagement, I want to know too, that the people who understand the changes affecting storage providers best are storage providers. Um, and I had this conversation with a group of Korean storage providers earlier today where we do not just want to be the ones proposing solutions and addressing problems. We do not want all of our fits coming from vertical labs and our partners. Uh, we want them coming from storage providers. We want them coming from community members. I've heard some storage providers discuss, you know, they're worried if, you know, uh, capacity storage providers are able to go and extend their deals all the way out three and a half years for some other sectors, um, then it's going to actually less be impactful with Filecoin Plus multiplier, right? This is a concern they have. Perfectly reasonable. What I would love to see is more engagement within our discussion forums um, with storage providers proposing additional fits that we could host in order to model out potential additional changes to lessen that burden. Um, there's lots and lots of ways that we could look into this, and I understand that storage providers don't have the same amount of free time available to work on this. They're probably very, very busy. Um, but one thing we can do is understand the challenges that may prevent you from participating in that knowledge and expertise and provide solutions to address it for you, whether it be staff to help you write these steps, um, whatever other resource you think comes to mind. Um, would love to learn from you more about what it would take to get you engaged and actually thinking about the solution space as well. One, one thing also um, as you consider all the different points of view here, put yourself in, other, in somebody else's shoes and look at the same question. Um, how do you think uh, CC providers felt when the Falcon Plus multiplier of 10x for value of you disappeared? What? You're going to, like, some, somebody else's activity is going to be worth 10x more than mine? Uh, yeah, because Falcon wants to store really useful, valuable data. So we're going to reward it. 10 times more for the for not the same work, but much more valuable work than ever. But yeah, it's 10 times more. So you know, think, think of all those different dynamics. Um, uh, this is a you know, complex system, complex protocol. One really valuable thing that could come out of this is, hey, we really need to kind of uh, think of very much more detangled, composable layers um, that could be kind of uh, layered differently so that the concerns are less intertwined. Um, so that actually is a really useful kind of design for Can I also just add one more thing? Like, um, at least it's not, it's not clear or debatable or, or maybe clear in another, in another way that this will would advantage uh, CCSP more so than the USP, right? So I think that's revisit the principle, right? Like this is a proof of useful network. If there is an SP who wants to invest large amount of resources into the network, they will get a bigger share of the pie. Right, that is the game that we. That's the game that most of these networks are playing, right? And um, and this bit doesn't change relative relationship between Fuel Plus and CC. If Fuel Plus is still worth 10x more than CC, right? Now we understand there might be a uh, understand might be a concern. All right, what if all the CC sectors just like extend a lot, they get a bigger share of power? What do we do, right? Um, so you also have to factor in that. Um, just extending CC is a one party action, whereas extending it, you know, there's two parties there, so it's definitely more complex for yes. you, right? Yes, for sure. Yes. Um, but having said that, right, like, because uh, we just want to remind ourselves we are in this like cooperative competition where we are all part of the network, even though we're competing against each other, uh, which is good, so that we all become, we all get more optimized, and more efficient, but we are all part of the network, right? Like if someone else invests a lot in the network, we shouldn't stop them, right? They are investing in our network, making us all more successful, and then like we are all part of this community. Oh, and lastly, they won't um, necessarily um, get a bigger advantage because um, uh, as they do that, they will also lower the initial pledge per QAP for the other SP who then like join later. Um, I think you know we're a little lower, but I, I want to add you think. Uh, this is a good session, so if anybody else has further questions, I think we can take one more. Um, um, if, if not, uh, if anyone wants to give like their kind of closing statement on 536, I think that'd be this would be a great time to do it. Will we ever? <laughs> <laughs> uh, their, their closing statement.
see it for now. Uh, I'm gonna go dress as fifth third six with Halloween cards. <laughs> <laughs> I guess my closing statement would be just a reminder and a call to action to please vote. I don't know what time zone we're even in right now, but I think you have about 16 hours left until the poll closes. Um, if you need help doing this, I will walk you through the process myself, but I think it's really important that everyone has an opportunity to let their voice be heard. Very rarely open up a poll for folks, so please take advantage of the opportunity. Uh, I want to express some appreciation for all the participants that helped do this. Um, you know, especially to you for just helping steward this entire process and helping us and dealing with all of the changes and adjustments from everybody all the time. So thank you for bearing uh, with all of this. Thank you to the Purdue team too for putting an enormous amount of time and effort into this. Uh, you have a lot of different things you could be working on that are all really valuable. And you've put in how many hours into this? Hundreds of hours probably all together uh, into the circle over the last few months. You have tons of other projects that are all really interesting and valuable. That you have to set aside in order to work through this, uh, to work with other ones. Extremely, but I think of like all of that cost, that is what 536 is costing us together. Um, thank you for putting your, your time there. Uh, and thank you for all the participants that make the company work what it is and for engaging with it, uh, working for it, um, and providing a lot of value to If we if, if think about it, okay, every kind of um, system and service that provides value to, to humanity goes through lots of challenges goes through lots of changes and so on. Um, as a community, well, we have to get really good at adapting to our environment. And it's really good to see moments like this that help us, help us improve. So thank you, thank you all for